Hi guys, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Villanova, and I'm the director of media at Fetch. We're a full service mobile marketing agency um, headquartered in London. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, just a little context to the presentation and just my background and what I do at Fetch is uh, basically, you know, one of the main uh, parts of my role is to look after our mobile media buying practice, how we buy smarter, uh, and a lot of that means to access programmatic uh, and, and social in more efficient ways and finding uh, more effective ways to do that. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to also talk about um, really some more specific strategies and tactics that have been really successful for us. So it might be a little bit different. Um, and I'll also caveat that there's a, a bit of a lean towards app developers. Um, our clients tend to be uh, businesses who um, see the mobile consumers as critical and, and the center of their business. And a lot of them are app developers like Uber, Apple, Facebook, Expedia. And so let's just jump right into it. So the first thing that we have to start off with is that mobile programmatic is continuing to grow. It's exploding. I think eMarketer, uh, the presentation talked about some of these statistics of there's a huge demand in mobile programmatic. Um, I think you know, every roundtable session that I was a part of, programmatic came up in some form or another. Um, but I'd like to do a quick poll. Um, I think we all know this, uh, but you know, of your mobile budgets, how much is currently dedicated to, uh, to programmatic and access programmatically? So first uh, show of hands for 25% or less is today kind of access programmatically. OK? That's fine. Uh, what about less than 50%? Less than 75%? OK, I guess everyone's over 75% <laughs> programmatically accessed or maybe not accessing programmatic at all um, today, which is completely uh, you know, re respective of you know, our client base as well. There's quite a very um, investment in programmatic. People don't, you know, there's a lot of challenges. Um, I think we could list a laundry list of uh, um, some of the things that are holding us back from really accessing programmatic. Um, and I'd, I'd like to say that it's, I think a lot of that is actually internal um, in that just the education and training uh, of our internal teams, of our client, getting them up to speed on how to access programmatic what to look out for has really kind of unlocked budget. Um, but I'm also going to just talk really quickly about some external factors. Um, and a few uh, that are a bit of the dark underbelly of the mobile industry. Um, and so the first one is that there's a very confused buying ecosystem. Um, you know, since dollars have been shifted from desktop to mobile, there's been this just land grab for um, you know, selling mobile inventory any way possible. Um, we've counted over 500 plus mobile specific media vendors that we've worked with just in the last few years. And that's just crazy. That's, that's a massive long tail and that's not efficient. And so our clients and, and our agency you know, is, is really about consolidating and focusing on the ones that really matter. Um, but it makes it difficult when um, you know, we're trying to access direct publisher inventory, and there's a myriad of ways to access that. And you've got ad networks who say they have direct traffic, but then ad networks also are now buying from exchanges and SSPs. Um, and then you've got these fun brokers in the space right, who basically don't have any inventory of their own and go out and resell anything and everything. And so it's a very um, incestuous, if you will, uh, space, it's, it becomes harder to understand the value chain and who's really um, getting you that media value at the end of the day. We have run a campaign where we're able to track um, through, um, through third-party systems that uh, one of our campaigns was rebrokered five times. So you know, we went to a, one ad network and said, here's our campaign, and we saw that link going to another affiliate, to another affiliate, to another five, five affiliates down and, and publishers down so that basically the, the initial cost of the ad unit we're paying is maybe 10 times higher than the actual bid price that we're getting at the end of the day. Um, so that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, and I think it's really about enforcing transparency with your buyers, whether they're in-house or in the agency side. I and mean, on the sales side, really understanding, you know, from your publisher team, how inventory is being accessed, how things are getting vetted, 
um, is, is really key. The second thing, mobile ad fraud. I love to show this picture. Um, and uh, we could give her the benefit of a doubt that she's just testing phones. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a chance that that's, that's some sort of ad fraud. Uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, you know, coming from the desktop and, and kind of world, I, I have to say I've, I've seen even more instances on campaigns of just fraud and just general shady behavior from uh, our media partners. Um, one estimate is that there's 40% uh, of mobile traffic is, is fraudulent. Um, another statistic is saying that of the traffic that's coming from China specifically, 10 to 15% are non-human sources, <laughs> which is fun. Um, and so it's, it's really important that uh, we have um, processes and systems in place to, to really monitor this, you know, so that we're not wasting ad dollars. And I think mobile's of the Wild West because there's still a lack of third-party verification, there's still a lack of tracking, there's still a lack of um, partners who can really do this on an automated basis. And so our agency has had to come up with creative solutions around taking raw data log files and doing analysis and, and making sure that you know, all our traffic is, is uh, where we want it to go uh, from a geographic standpoint and also uh, you know, coming from real users. So those are just two you know, challenges. I know there's quite a few. And um, so there's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of um, shady behavior happening with rebrokering and fraud. But you know, if you're going to start in programmatic, where, where would you even start in investing? And I, I would like to make the case that there's about five key channels um, to look at. And this, I'm getting pretty specific here. And apologize if it's a little too tactical. but. Um, from, you know, I think we all know Facebook is the, the elephant in the room, um, and that they have built a business now um, that's over 60% of their ad revenue is coming from mobile. Of, 60, of that 60% revenue, it's estimated that over 50% is now uh, from the mobile app install unit. So app developers are driving this, this massive change. So on the quality index, they're the furthest along. In terms of cost, we'll talk a little bit about that, but they're kind of you know, depending on your objective, and um, they're, they're kind of uh, in the middle. And then you've got RTB exchanges, so accessing that through a DSP, their trading desk, um, still quite high and quite expensive um, in, in comparison. We've got Twitter, then IAD and Google, who also just, all these channels we see as all programmatic because you access them through a, a real-time kind of self-service platform, you're buying audiences, and I think it really takes the same kind of paradigm shift of uh, kind of culture and internal philosophy of how you access this. And it's, it's nimble and quick optimization, iterate. Um, and it's, it's no longer this kind of traditional slow buying. So I'm gonna dive into a few of these really quickly. So Facebook, we know, massive opportunity. You have to kind of work with Facebook if you're promoting applications, uh, you, don't, you don't have to, but it, it's, it's hard to ignore. Um, but the, the trend over looking up over the last year in, in cost per click and conversion rates is that cost per clicks are steadily rising, of course, with uh, the holidays. Um, and, and from a year ago, it's, the average is a little bit higher. And so it's becoming increasingly more competitive. App marketers are, are really pushing uh, the costs up. But at the same time, what's interesting is you see conversion rates um, steadily increasing. Um, and so, you know, we can point to a couple different things there. And I think uh, the main um, thing that Facebook is doing is, is innovating really quickly. They're coming out with new ad units, they're coming out with new targeting features, tools that have really allowed us to keep pace with even increased costs and, and optimize at a more efficient rate and, and drive conversion rates up. And you know, an example of some of the creative innovation they have, one very small tactic is uh, a multi-product ad, which they've recently come out with a few months ago and has by far been one of the best performing ad units. And I, I think, um, you know, we think of, we talk about just more banners. <laughs> I was joking uh, earlier that we just need more banners and smaller banners. No, this, in mobile performance, there's actually 
um, great canvases for, for telling stories still and, and letting ideas um, resonate with, with consumers. And so you think of this multi-product, which is basically five kind of slates for one advertiser that you can you know, showcase different products. You can maybe tell a story um, from left to right of, uh, of kind of your user flow. Uh, one great example for us was Expedia, who um, hyper-targeted certain locations, say San Francisco, and then ran five different key locations, uh, destinations, sorry, um, in, the, in the imagery. And so, you know, you're, you're in San Francisco, well, maybe your, your key destinations are LA, Las Vegas, um, and, and Seattle. Uh, and then um, that, that, this is consistently performed well, and I think it's um, just another, another way to, to tell a story there. Another one is uh, this kind of cinemagraph type unit um, on Facebook. So Apple came to us and uh, has been asking us to promote some of their iTunes products. And they had a huge release of releasing all ep six episodes of Star Wars on iTunes. And so we said, how do we just take some small innovations and try to drive you know, bigger differences with you know, the limited content and creative library they have? So they had all this video. We said, how do we just make video compelling, but not have to pay you know, the premiums of video costs and use this type of format, which is a cinemagraph. Essentially, uh, it's kind of a looped GIF um, taken from a video, and it's, it's, it's driven lifts on conversion rates and CTRs. But it's that small little difference that's made. Uh, I'm sorry, the small little innovation that's made the, the greatest difference. So just to, to boil it down for Facebook, Three strategies for success. Um, measure downstream. Look at the quality of the user. Um, cost might be high, but really where Facebook does well is, is quality. Um, again, capitalize on the latest innovations. And then find the right tools and partners. And I think many times the question isn't asked, should we even use a tool? Is a tool even necessary? And I think there's Facebook's system is and self-service system is a uh, is iterating so quickly that it, many times it doesn't make sense to pay kind of tech fees on that. Really quickly, Twitter. <laughs> I think all investors have seen this. Is there a growth problem with Twitter? Um, from Q4 last year, um, they had the, the smallest increase in monthly active users in 1.4%. Um, they're still a pretty big player in 302 million monthly active users. But to put it in perspective, they could potentially be the fourth, fifth, maybe even sixth largest kind of social network based in the US. If you think of now that Snapchat, um, Facebook, Facebook Messenger, uh, Instagram now is advertising. So you know, in terms of your prioritization, we come back next year and Twitter might be an odd player out. Quickly again, uh, some insights for, for Twitter. The main challenges are around you know, is there going to be that kind of global reach um, for Twitter? Um, some of the tools still just lack behind Facebook. It's still a very manual process. Um, and we've seen certain increases in um, quality by, by vertical. So music and entertainment and certain types of content perform so much exceptionally better than uh, on Twitter and uh, than others. Um, the key strategies for Twitter, I would say, Think of Twitter as, as the much more real-time, fresh version of Facebook that deserves that kind of uh, volume of iteration and, 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 uh, and creative. Um, and so you have to think about resourcing it differently, think about um, staffing, uh, even how you manage the Twitter campaign much more differently than, than even Facebook. And it's all about hyper-targeting and hyper-relevancy. So think about promoting StubHub in San Francisco to Giants fans, for a specific game coming up in two days at a certain ticket price with specific tailored creative. That's what performs best in this real-time platform. Um, really quickly, Google and IAD. So, you know, monsters in, in terms of volume, and they've been around since 2009, one of the first um, to, to kind of invest in mobile advertising. I think, you know, they've kind of fallen behind in terms of the app marketing space because of uh, their inability to track certain events, um, and um, I th they just haven't really put the resources behind. Um, you know, I think Google's, of course, always have paid search, 
But in terms of display and video units, that's really just, just taken off recently. And then IAD is always focused on rich media, but they're now kind of blending that with performance and kind of more general types of um, opportunities. And I think the two biggest things uh, that are coming up for Google is Google Play is now potentially having advertising. So the ent entire Google Play app store is potentially going to work the same way that you could with paid search, which is a huge uh, game change. And then I had, of course, recently opened up their inventory programmatically. So now that makes them a lot more interesting in terms of being able to scale and, and effectively optimize uh, on IAD. And then lastly, mobile RTB and exchanges. So I think we all can attest there's, there's a lot of challenges from buying straight off the exchanges and RTB directly. Um, at the end of the day, it's just performance has been spotty. Um, you can see some of the CTR uh, differences from DSPs to exchanges versus just going ne network and, and publisher. Of course, this is just a, a benchmark, but um, I think it just speaks to how there's a lot of growth and innovation that still needs to happen in mobile RTB and exchange inventory. But we've had some success at Fetch, uh, just continuing to test over the last couple of years. And I think where we found the most success is finding and, and, and partnering with mobile programmatic experts. So not just programmatic experts, but folks who really understand the nuances with mobile, the, the tracking and the optimization and different levers that you could pull and the data and the wealth of it that's, that's completely different from desktop and any other channel. Um, and, and actually what's worked really well for us is um, both building an internal team of programmatic experts who, who access social and programmatic, so audience buying across platforms, um, and setting up kind of really small two to three person pod structures that just iterate quickly and just are data geeks uh, and, and just you know, analysts and, fin and financial backgrounds, search backgrounds, um, who've just been really spending the time necessary to, to do it, which is, which is key. Um, and of course, we have a uh, you know, agency trading desk partner of Amnet, who's been really great, who have tons of experience and, and resource to, to help us scale campaigns. Um, secondly, I already talked about transparency, which is really key. Um, but I think even this breakfast, we were talking about um, just how a lot of things operate in a black box, especially in mobile programmatic. But I think it's, it's really about asking the right questions asking for insights, asking for the right data, what's working, what's not from your uh, programmatic partners. And then lastly, test, learn, and iterate. And I think that's the kind of overarching theme, I would say, across all these programmatic channels that we uh, just talked about. It really takes a cultural change, as I think Angela talked about, internally with our clients, with our partners, of how to access this type of inventory. It takes nimble, quick um, you know, iterations and working with creative teams that are willing to be just as flexible. Um, not to say don't come up with great big ideas and, and do long-term planning, but you have to also be able to adjust really quickly on the fly. And I think that's where we found the most success and uh, where we really see the, the future going for mobile programmatic. Mm -hmm.